Welcome everybody to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. You guys did such a good job of quieting down earlier, I just have to say. It's not like when we have the political forums, we have all these political people in here and they just keep continuing to talk. Uh, I'm Kermit Whitfield, member of the CMC Board of Trustees and Senior Assistant Vice President of Communications at United Way of Central Ohio. It's great to see everyone here today. CMC is brought to us, thank you, with support from Carlisle, Patchen, and Mur Murphy LLP and Battelle, both of whom have many friends and associates in the audience. Won't you please help me thank them? In the news today, and pretty much every day, is a story about data hacking, loss of privacy, and how somebody somewhere is trying to get you, and information all about you, from your bank, your social media account, your phone, your Google search, or from that, what animal are you test that you took on Facebook last week? <laughs> For some reason, wombat. I don't know why. I don't know how they, I don't know what the algorithm is. Uh, it wasn't all that long ago when paper shredders were up to the task of protecting our privacy. Now, since paper records have gone the way of the dodo for a number of places, protecting our privacy and securing our connected world is the task of the day for our best and our brightest. Please welcome Chief Information Officer, the Ohio Attorney General's Office, Urban Rogers II, Chief Information Officer, Battelle, David White, Vice President, Chief Cybersecurity Innovator, Columbus Collaboratory, Jeff Schmidt, and our host, VP of Product and Business Development for the Columbus Collaboratory, Nathan Vega. Nathan, podium's yours. Uh, thank you for hosting us here today. I, um, uh, cybersecurity is actually not my background. I actually have been looking at the space for about three years. And it's amazing though when you start to think about it, and I'm glad that you guys are here to hear more about it because I think there are several things that are occurring and one of them is just evolving awareness on what cybersecurity is and what it means uh, and how does it impact us. Uh, and just, just a little short anecdote about, about that. Uh, how many people have a mobile phone here, right? Everybody? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, back, what, last May or so, Apple said, hey, we've got this new technology, Face ID coming out. You're gonna be able to just look at your phone open it up, you can pay with things, right? Paying with my face, sounded great. I mean, that is a huge problem I had with the old iPhones is how many times do I have to punch in all these numbers? And I was really excited about it. I and mean, that was really cool. I made the call at like four o'clock in the morning. I was one of the first in lines. I was gonna get it on the day of. Then I started thinking for a second, okay, wait, I've been looking at this space. What does that really mean for me? What am I trading off here in terms of convenience? It's in the news, right? It's not uncommon that you can go through a border security gate now and have them open your phone and look at your social profile, look at your mail, look at your files, right? I don't have anything to hide, but at the same time, I don't want anybody to know what I'm looking for either, right? And so those, I had to make those considerations. I actually canceled my pre-order. Uh, I spent about a week or two trying to understand what that technology is, what was the background behind it. It's really fascinating. I mean, if you really get into it, it's got, it's like a miniature Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Connect. It, looks at 200 discrete muscles on your face. It's like one in a million. I mean, these are, it's really cool technology. It took me about a week or two to figure out what that was and understand what was behind the scenes if that was hacked. If I'm dead, can somebody use my phone to open it with my face? I don't know. I needed to answer those questions. By the time I got to ordering the phone, I was, I got back in line, I got my phone three months later, right? So within a week or so, I had fallen behind and not able to get my phone for three months. And this is for an individual consumer product from a company that largely has earned my trust in Apple, right? So when I thought about that and I said, now transport that to business and the role of CIO that some of these guys are doing, right? They're looking at hundreds of vendors, thousands of vendors software products, hardware products, cloud, on-prem, off-prem, mobile devices brought in. Imagine having to take that and scale it across an enterprise and look at what, is, what are we really putting in place? What risk am I trading off for convenience? What are these new things? And that awareness alone and just being able to understand that and ask those questions, I think is the evolving place that we're at in terms of individuals, right? We're asking a lot of our vendors to keep us safe 
But at the end of the day, we are the weakest component in that cybersecurity world, right? We're the ones that click on the links to the cat videos. We're the ones that install the malware thinking it was something else, an Excel spreadsheet, right? So the awareness part is important. So I'm glad that you guys are here and I'm glad that we have this panel to, to talk about that. Um, and in that same vein, I, I, you know, I think it's important that we keep thinking about these things and it is only gonna be something that we consider um, more and more over time. Uh, so, so with that, I want to hand it over the, to the panel. Uh, the first question I always like to ask, I think it's on everybody's mind. Uh, I'll ask Jeff, he's a career cybersecurity guy. Um, Jeff, why are cybersecurity people so grumpy all the time? <laughs> <laughs> are you calling me grumpy? <laughs> well, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think that there's probably a, a, a proportion or a relationship between how long you've been in the field and how grumpy you are. Um, so I've been in the field, uh, I like to say, since before it was cool. Uh, I've been doing uh, security since the, the early 90s. Um, I think what frustrates security people is uh, we see a lot of the same problems happening over and over again. Um, you know, and some of the major breaches that have occurred recently um, have been the result of uh, failure to apply patches. Really? I mean, we've known about that since about 1987. Um, but it's hard, you know, in a very large environment. Uh, it's uh, just, uh, you know, just ask uh, Equifax how hard it is to, uh, to keep a large system uh, up to date. Um, I think things like that uh, frustrate security people. I think that uh, um, issues with law enforcement and jurisdiction and difficulty and criminalizing uh, some of these activities, there's really no cost to the bad guys. Um, that's kind of um, dejecting if you're a defender. Um, you know, if you are operating in the, the, the physical world and you have a bad guy that's just, you know, running around, um, you know, mugging people, uh, eventually they're going to get caught and they're going to be in jail and that's going to be a score for the good guys. Um, in the cyber world, that really doesn't happen. The bad guys, particularly um, outside of friendly jurisdictions, operate largely with impunity. Um, and if they get caught or they get turned away, um, eh, you know, too bad, so sad, they'll do it again uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, and, and so that's also very frustrating um, as, as defenders uh, as well. Um, also, I guess there's a relationship between um, how long you've been in tech and how much gray hair you have um, and, and how generally, you know, grumpy or persnickety you are. So there's, there's, there's some of that as well. <laughs> Jess' photo was taken last week, by the way. Um, <laughs> so if you read the Verizon data breach report that comes out every year, they said 90% of the, the breaches are uh, for uh, basically monetary gain, right? And it's either going to be monetary gain or uh, industrial espionage. And there, there is an evolving set of threats if you look at Maersk as a, um, a ransomware attack or an attack, a worm attack. We've had a number of those that have occurred. These evolving threats are, are creating challenges for businesses um, that they hadn't anticipated before, right? I'm a distribution company, why would you, you're not stealing something, I don't have finances, I don't have a bank account back here that you can steal from, but it, you can shut down the business, right? And you can actually impact their revenues and their customers and the downstream impacts this third parties that they work for. Um, in that same vein, so, um, you know, David, um, you've been around for a while, you've been doing the CIO role at Battelle, and what, can you talk a little bit about how you've seen threats evolve, how you've seen um, the, the, the role of CIO and, and security and specifically evolve? Sure, um, but let me start with kind of answering Jeff's question too. Uh, I think that we should almost change our title from CIO to chief bad guy. Uh, I mean, because we are the guys that are telling the folks that work for us, no, you can't do that. No, you can't bring that device in here. No, you can't download that software. And there's a reason for that. We don't do it because we want to tell you no. It's because you expose us and the attack um, vector um, becomes open for people coming in to compromise our environments. Um, if you work with us, we can work with you to get things done. But you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times the first word of our, out of our mouths is no. But so, you know, how are people coming after us? How are they attacking us? Um, the, 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 the threat vectors have changed. Um, they're coming after us in a lot of ways, but you know, even though things have changed, one thing has um, become very consistent, and that is email. Um, phishing email, people coming after us via email, compromising uh, credentials to get into your environment, is still probably the number one attack that people will see. 
you'll see um, very, very sophisticated emails coming into your environments, and, and we've seen some really sophisticated ones um, that are um, based in social engineering. Um, so we love to put all of our information out there, whether it is on your corporate website, your social media. Um, we know who the CEO is. We know what his org chart looks like. We know how to go up and down your chain. And so we know where to send the emails and what type of email to send you in order for you to think that it's legit. And once you respond to that, once you click that, that, that link you had, and it only takes us one time, um, and what we've also seen is uh, a lot of the uh, folks that are coming after you have changed their tactics, and instead of coming directly after you, they will go one level out. And so they will figure out who you're doing business with, and they're going to do a compromise of Jeff. And once they compromise Jeff, they now have legitimate credentials to communicate with you, and they'll come right through the front door. Uh, it's no longer looking at, oh, I see this threat out here. You know, I think this is Jeff, and I'll give him all access that he needs. Now you have a real problem. Um, that's, I believe, the way that um, um, Target was had, right? There was a legitimate uh, credentials that were used to get into their environment, and once that happened, they were able to go all across that network and compromise the entire company. So think about it from a CIO perspective, from a CEO perspective. Are those people still in their jobs? No, because they thought they, they had it covered and they really didn't. So it takes a, a level of humbleness to, to understand that, you know, the, the, there's a saying in the security world, either there are two companies out there, um, those that have been hacked or those that don't know that they've been hacked. <laughs> right. uh, that's really true. Um, the, the bad guys that are coming after us are very sophisticated and they have a lot of tools and they can change probably quicker than we can change to combat them. Uh, 162 days to the average time of detection or something like that, I believe. Right. Um, Urban, do you have anything to add? You know, yeah. So I always like to think of uh, cybersecurity as uh, Tootsie Roll Pop. You know, how many licks does it take to get to the center? And a, a lot of that is uh, with regards to the, the, the folks that are around you. It's no longer the senior citizens that are being targeted and compromised to get their bank accounts, et cetera. It, it's, it's the gamut. And if it's sometimes too true to be true, it's, that's, it's valid. Um, you have just won a $100 gift certificate. All you need to do is click on this very link. Nine times out of 10, if you click on that link, even though it says www.amazon.com free money, if you hover over it, you'll see that it's taking you someplace that you don't want to go to. So um, I've learned to appreciate cybersecurity uh, from a CIO perspective because it's in my domain. When I lost my CISO, which stands for, um, trying not to use a lot of acronyms here, but uh, Chief Information Security Officer, I became the CIO and the CISO. Um, so, you know, having arguments with myself as to whether I should do this, do this not, you know, it's the Jekyll and Hyde, you know, kind of a scenario. But at the end of the day, um, you know, security is very important. And, and David's right, you know, we often say no um, uh, initially to try and figure out, okay, how does this impact the overall environment? Um, you know, Jeff made the comment with regards to, you know, uh, hair going gray. Well, in my case, uh, no hair. <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, I'll add though, there's, there is good news. So despite my grumpiness as a security guy, um, I'm also generally an optimist. And um, I think that so many people in the IT space and in the security space behave as though um, all this stuff just kind of comes at us at random. Um, and that all we can do is, you know, plug holes in the dam. Uh, and and react to all the you know crazy you know uber elite kids that can you know hand write code um, and and in reality and this is good for us on the defense side bad guys are lazy right bad guys are lazy and they tend to do the same things over and over and over again they do the same things over and over and over again because they work email works phishing works right um, so that's good for us defenders, uh, because if we focus on what the bad guys are actually doing and understand what the bad guys are actually doing and defend against that, uh, then um, our defenses will be um, far, far better than if we kind of do this, what I see a lot, defending in a vacuum or defending against a ghost. Um, there is a cyber playing field, if you will. There is a field of play. There are 
uh, plays that the bad guys use. Um, very, very common techniques, very common tools. Um, and so uh, it's important for, for all of us as defenders in our business environment and in our personal environment to understand what sorts of plays the bad guys will use against us and defend against that. So you touched on something there, uh, the bad guys are lazy. I, I, I think it is a job, right? If you start to break it down, the, the criminals, are, this, is a, this is a way for them to make money. They're gonna do it in the least amount of effort possible to make the money, just like a lot of people will do at their job, right? I'm gonna, I don't need to dig five holes today, I'm gonna dig four, because that's what they asked me to do, right? And so um, in that same vein, uh, it makes me think about um, one of the conversations a lot of people have, like how can, how can, I, how can all these things happen, right? We see a lot of the, um, the scale happening in terms of attacks. And, um, and Jeff, I'm just gonna cue you because you have a great anecdote around uh, the script kitties and how there's really only a very small number of people that have this sophistication to build the tools. However, um, the number of people grows exponentially very rapidly. Um, yeah, that's, uh, so, you know, if you read uh, the, the, the papers and, and the media, you know, it sounds like new vulnerabilities are being discovered every day and, you know, this is vulnerable and that's vulnerable and there's this bug or this exploit. And again, it, it, it just sounds, you know, in, in, incomprehensible or undefendable. But if, if you look at what's actually the, the, the structure of the space, there's actually a very small number of individuals globally that are discovering new vulnerabilities. Um, that are, you know, actually the, the people that are finding uh, these, these particular issues. Thousands globally, single digit thousands, very small. Many of them work for governments and intelligence agencies and some of them work for our governments and our intelligence agencies. Some of them are independent researchers. But it's a relatively small community. Um, in, unless you're in the national security space, critical infrastructure space, you're not facing those people directly. You're facing people that are using their tools and their techniques and that have weaponized them and wrapped them in tools. So your standard bad guy that's you know, looking to, to make a couple thousand dollars um, isn't inventing some new vulnerability to you know, hack you. Um, they're using a tool or a technique that's well understood, that's used by lots of other folks um, and is targeting lots of other people at the same time. This is an important dynamic in the space because it actually, if defenders work to understand that dynamic, it makes us more efficient because there's actually a relatively small number of techniques that we need to understand and defend against that are being used by a large number of attackers against us across the board. So we can kind of flip the dynamics of the space to our advantage as defenders. Um, and, uh, and, and by really understanding what the bad guys are bringing to bear um, and understanding how we defend against that, we'll get better. So we're, we're, we're cruising through a lot of topics here and it's a short amount of time. Um, but one thing I did want to try to focus on, and we've got a few more minutes before we'll ask for questions, was um, you know, a lot of times it's really, how do I get started or what can I be doing differently and what am I not really thinking about? Uh, and oftentimes I think we focus a lot on um, it's gotta be super sophisticated to solve the challenge. But I think um, Jeff has been uh, instrumental in really helping us at the collaboratory build products and services around being practical, but also helping mentor other uh, CISOs in the space on how to be practical, how to think about getting started, how to move from A to B, because it's not about the end state as much as it's how am I maturing uh, and understanding the landscape. And as we think about evolving threats, changing legislation, those are important aspects. So I wanted to ask you, Jeff, you know, what would you give advice? What, what are practical things? How do, we, how do people get started? What would you recommend for people um, to right. look at? So, uh, you know, it's, it, it's funny. Uh, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, I guess, that security people are, are grumpy um, is, is because so much of, of what happens in our space is just fundamentally not practical. Um, it, it's a very um, blinky light, vendor, you know, whiz bang driven space. Um, if you've been, to, if, if you're, you know, in IT and uh, have been to any of the big, you know, trade shows in security or you get marketed to um, by security vendors and security vendors are fine, we need them. However, um, 
it's, it's very disorienting and very confusing. No matter what your question is or no matter what your problem is, there's a tool for that. There's something to buy and it solves, you know, this little part of the problem and there's 75 other pieces over here that, that um, you probably should be looking at but, but aren't. And it's very confusing. Um, the, the largest security trade show in our space uh, is a, a show every year in San Francisco called RSA and it's um, daunting um, how many vendors are there and and you know even as a security guy it's hard to walk around and even just understand what people are doing um, it, it's it's a very very inaccessible and very difficult space and so you know we're here in Columbus Ohio I like you know good old Midwest practical security you know talk to me about vulnerability management you know don't worry about um, you know your you know, Uber super duper intrusion prevention system or your, you know, CASB or your, you know, don't stop, hang on with all those things. First, make sure that you go home every night and you're happy with how you're doing with vulnerability management. Vulnerability management is, you know, anytime you have more than two systems, you're gonna have a, an order, right, of what they get patched. Understanding how they're patched and what when they're patched and in what order, what priority order, that's vulnerability management. By the way, Read the uh, GAO report about the Equifax breach. It's fascinating. So GAO investigated uh, the Equifax breach because IRS uh, was, a, was a big client, and so GAO thought they should look into it. Um, and Equifax is a sophisticated organization. No, no picking on anybody, but the GAO report reads uh, like a comedy of errors. Um, the, uh, there was a basic phone, uh, uh, failure in vulnerability management. They had an internal email list. They knew about the uh, particular vulnerability. Most of their sysadmins got out and patched it, but the email list wasn't quite up to date and they missed a few, okay? Um, you know, and then just on and on with this kind of failure and basic blocking and tackling, right? That's how we're getting hurt. We're getting hurt when, you know, Mabel in accounting clicks on an email that she, you know, shouldn't have clicked on because it had uh, cat videos. That's not Mabel and accounting's fault, right? That's, that's people like me's fault for having a system that makes Mabel understand that or, or fails when she doesn't. Um, but <coughs> it's, it's important to understand the basics, okay? Uh, David mentioned multi-factor authentication. So once you go home every day and you're <coughs> happy with your vulnerability management system and you feel great and you sleep well at night because all your systems are, are patched and, and up to date and you feel good about that, then start thinking about credentialing. So human beings choose horrible passwords. We know human beings choose horrible passwords. How many people, don't raise your hand, but have you know, some combination of go bucks you know, in their password? Uh, how, you know, how many people have? Change it every 90 days. Uh, remember it though, right? Right. <laughs> so you know, fascinating little anecdote here. Uh, up until last year, the <coughs> payment card industry, uh, the, 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 um, the standard for passwords was of the sets, uppercase, lowercase, digits, and special characters, you had to have at least three of those four, and you have to change your password uh, every 90 days. We've all probably dealt with some, you know, you type in something, no, that's not strong enough. You type in something, no, that's not strong enough. You know, put some more exclamation marks on the end, you know? <clears throat> okay, well, okay. So when faced with uppercase, lowercase, digits, special, change your password every 90 days, what do human beings do? They come up with a password strategy like spring 2018 exclamation mark, fall 2018 exclamation mark. Okay, well that's fine. You think the bad guys have that figured out? Absolutely. What helps you with that? Multi-factor authentication, just like David said. So after you're really happy about your vulnerability management program and you sleep well every night, now start thinking about authentication, passwords, passwords, multi-factor. If you can use a cloud platform like Office 365 or something that will basically give you multi-factor for free, use it. All of our personal accounts, so if you use Google, if you use your bank, your banks mostly require you to do something now. Anywhere you can turn on multi-factor, do it. It's not a panacea, um, but it makes the bad guy's job a lot harder and they'll probably just go on to somebody else. The third thing I would say that's less technical is to start thinking about security as a risk problem, not a technology problem. So most people in information security grew up as technologists. Me, I'm a nerd, I've been a nerd for all my life. Um, and most people in security are nerds. And so the answer to a security question or a security problem is technology, um, is a tool, is you know some blinky light thing. That's fine. 
Um, but increasingly, uh, security uh, should be viewed as and discussed as a risk question. Um, risk of partners, risk of relationships. Um, what can be transferred and dealt with in contracts? What can be transferred and dealt with with vendor management programs? What sorts of questions do we want to ask of our HVAC vendors? Should our HVAC vendors really be able to, you know, get onto our core cash register network? Just ask Target how they feel about that one. Um, you know, these are these are business risk questions, um, and the successful next generation of security practitioners will be able to communicate in terms of risk with the business, um, with their CEOs, with their boards, with their risk committees or CFOs. Um, and, and I would encourage all of us to, to think about trade-offs and risk as opposed to just making it a technical problem. So it's, I'm it, it's interesting, uh, you know, you, you bring that up and the, the next generation of security uh, individuals that are coming through. I um, was uh, talking to my daughter the other night and she's at the Metro School and, and um, the Metro School sent uh, all the parents a notice that they were going to implement uh, monitoring of all the kids' web traffic uh, while on their network. So I was like, talking to my daughter, I said, hey, the Metro's gonna start monitoring your web traffic. You need to be careful what you're doing. She's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, no, no, really, you need, to, you need to be worried about it. Like, Why are you talking to me about this? I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm looking at, I'm, I want to look at myself in the mirror, like I must have a third head or something, there's something going on. I said, you know, this is a concern for you. Said, well, what are they talking about? I said, well, they're going to monitor what you're doing. He said, well, but I've been using the VPN since eighth grade. Well, why is that an issue? I what? <laughs> so these kids are actually much more sophisticated than a lot of the adults I deal with, and they know security a whole lot better than a lot of us. And they know to, to encrypt their traffic and to do VPNs, and they've been doing this for years. It's just second nature for them. We're, we're at uh, 12.57, we'd like to take questions from CMC, so I, I would, uh, if you guys have some questions, I would encourage you guys to make your way over to the microphone over here on the side, and we'll ask for a couple of them in a minute, but Irvin, I wanted to give you a chance too if you wanted to talk about them. Yeah, so I, I think for the most part, um, you know, a, a lot of businesses, again, I'll, I'll hit on, you know, what can you do free? Uh, there are a lot of free antivirus uh, software that you can install on your machine. It's not the latest and greatest. However, there is some level of, of capability. Uh, passwords. Make sure your passwords aren't, you don't use the same password, go bucks uh, 1987 uh, for everything. Make sure that there is a combination of some sort that you can remember, catchphrases, et cetera. Um, and if you're looking for free resources, um, if you go to theohioattorneygeneral.gov, I'm not pushing it, but I'm, I'm pushing free products. And if you type in Cyber Ohio, you'll come back with presentations um, that are that have been a combination of uh, board members, uh, those that are working in that group, um, where you can download free resources that are available to you today, no charge. Also, um, uh, you can request to have presentations and a team will come out and uh, get you up to speed uh, so that you're in the playing field. Great. I, I see a question back here. I'm Carol Looper. I have been getting at least two calls a day on my cell, two calls a day on my landline. They are from different area codes, and they all say, I am your Microsoft technician, and I need to check your uh, desktop because you have a problem. My response is always, I have a son and a grandson who work for Microsoft. You are not my Microsoft technician. Please take me off your list. However, they are coming from different area codes, including 614. I write them down and I try to block them, but I think there are too many to block. I say, take me off your list. What can I do to stop these calls? So the, the phenomenon you're describing is, um, Nathan mentioned earlier, you know, the bad guys, for the most part, most bad guys that we face, right, are rational criminal actors. They just want money, right? So that's actually helpful in a number of ways for defenders because we're dealing with a rational adversary. Um, dealing with irrational adversaries is, is really, really hard, actually. Um, and so this particular scam, there's been quite a bit of it lately, and I've been getting those calls too. Um, they um, have a story, and basically at the end of the day, they want to get your credit card number, your bank account information. And there's different cover stories. There's tech support. There's, you know, we found some lost funds. Um, there's, you know, a whole, a whole bunch of cover stories um, that uh, they're all 
plays on the old Nigerian scams of 15 years ago, right, where we got the emails that said we were an heir to a Nigerian prince and, you know, they want to split a million bucks with us. Um, this is the modern version of those. Um, a funny thing uh, about our kids, so I have a nine-year-old and he has learned to, it's, it's actually called trolling, but you basically play with those people. Um, so, you know, when, when, when they call, you know, you're doing it with, with your, you know, with, with your, your son and your grandson at Microsoft, but um, my, my son will, you know, understand immediately, and he's nine, will understand immediately what's going on. And he'll say, oh my gosh, my computer, you know, sure, what do I need to do? You know, what do I need to press? And, you know, he'll get them going and, you know, wait a minute, this, what do I need to do here? And they're just, he's just, you know, having fun and eventually they'll, they'll hang up. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, yeah, but but aside from that, in all honesty, there there actually really isn't anything you can do. Um, the numbers um, roll um, because they've compromised PBX systems and have access to more telephone numbers than any of us, you know, have. And so um, there's nothing you can do other than just you know block them, ignore them. Um, if you're, you know, if it's a quiet Thursday night and you want to have fun with them, go for it. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, oh, I, one, one thing in particular though, uh, they have found that um, our, our parents, um, older folks, elderly folks are particularly vulnerable um, to these sorts of scams. Um, my mom is pretty astute, uh, but she got a, uh, one of these phone calls that said that it was the IRS and they needed to talk to her about her tax return. And you know, she called me and said, well, that one I have to take, right? I'm like, no, especially not that one. <laughs> I think we need to look out for people that may, um, that, that, that may, may be more vulnerable. Um, we need to take care of each other and look out for people and educate people. I, I would also echo that. It's not just the phone calls, it's the, the emails that are coming to our older uh, citizens that uh, they just don't know what's legit. I commend you for coming out with a Microsoft uh, technician. Uh, that, that's, that's a fantastic defense. Um, one of the things that we've learned uh, is that their tech support is the best in the world. I mean, they will go out of their way. Well, they're motivated because they want to get your information. So hats off to you. They do work for Microsoft, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Carol Newcomb, and Jeff and Nathan, nice to see you. I have one simple question. I have at least 50 passwords. Right now I have them handwritten on a piece of paper, which I have to find every time I can't remember one. Is there a better way to keep all these passwords? Yeah, keypass.info. <laughs> Free tool in the spirit, uh, keypass, K-E-E-pass.info. Uh, to free tool, I have no affiliation. It's the one that I use. So there are several password managers out there. Um, increasingly, our operating systems are doing it for us. Um, so a modern um, Mac OS with modern Safari um, will actually suggest, like when, when it comes to a field where it's typing a new password, if you notice, it'll actually come up with a random password for you and say, hey, do you want to use this? There's a password manager kind of built in. Um, and those and those are those are good as well, um, but yeah, look into look into one of the free tools, LastPass, KeyPass, something like that. Hi, I'm Trip Lazarus. Um, I and as a former software developer, um, I'm I'm wondering what government can do to help us here. I mean, it it just seems to me that on a, a telephone. Uh, there should be some way where we can guarantee that who, the caller ID is accurate, that people aren't allowed to spoof. Um, that's, you know, that would get rid of so much. And the same with email, I understand that would be much more difficult uh, because it's, the systems are more open, but you would think maybe we do need to proceed to a world where these links and these networks have the force of law behind them uh, instead of it being the Wild West. I've just wondered what your all comment about that would be. You know, as fast as we can come up with the, um, uh, the laws, uh, the, the criminals are, you know, one step, two step, three steps ahead. Um, I, I get those same phone calls, um, and it's along lines of, um, so I kept my number from originally from Lansing, Michigan, and I, I kept my phone number, and um, th it looks like so someone's calling me from back home. 
So initially I started answering it, and after a while it's just like, it's just mirroring off of my, my telephone number, but it's, it's the spoofing technology that they have. And by the time you catch up with them, our consumer uh, section, they're doused with all of the complaints that we get. As soon as we track them down, they're shut down that office and they're on to doing something different. So I, I think it's just a matter of trying to stay in tune and, and continue to um, uh, create new legislature that would kind of eventually catch up with them in the end. I think we call it whack-a-mole. Right. As soon as you find one and you, you combat that, it pops up someplace else. So, it, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do. The, you, you raise a, an age-old um, philosophical question, though, um, that actually has been debated as long as, as I've been in the space. And it's um, about requiring authenticated access to networks, right? So if you peel apart all the problems we have, right, with the phone situation, with the internet, with email, with everything, the, the basic problem is that, um, what's the old comic? Um, nobody knows that, yeah, on, the inter on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. You guys see that, right, 15 years ago? Uh, one frame, um, but, you know, I can connect and interact on the internet with no assertion of identity, with no proof of identity, um, in fact, I can um, interact on the internet and assert my identity as anybody up here or any of you. Um, and that whole set of um, problems is the root cause of most of the security issues that we have today, if you peel it all apart. On the flip side, that is also the core reason that the internet has grown into the defining innovation of humanity. Um, one of the, and the free and open exchange of information that it is globally um, is because of the ability to connect and interact with relative ease, connect and interact without onerous identification requirements. Um, and every time somebody has come up with some sort of a plan or idea proposal to introduce onerous identification or authentication requirements, uh, I think valid free speech, First Amendment, freedom of the press, all of those sorts of issues start to come up correctly. And then about 35 seconds later, somebody will say, yeah, well, you know who requires strong identification of internet actors? China. So do we want to really do that? Um, it, it's, it's a trade-off. You know, I would say probably as humanity, we're getting a lot more benefit and we got to figure out how to, how to deal with these, these issues. I, I think we also see just that vein. We're, we see the rapid evolution of technology forcing us into spaces that maybe we didn't anticipate. So as a, a distinct example, my phone and our phones more and more becoming our authentication device, right? It's, it's a semblance of us. Our phone number was never meant to be that, right? In our, and so this evolution, we want you know, easy things to do. We want uh, the new technologies and uh, oftentimes we move so fast that we don't think about necessarily the ramifications of what that has to do. Uh, and I, th I think we see that in the spillover of these systems being compromised in easy ways because it was inherent in the system before. It wasn't, it wasn't there. Um, can you talk a little bit about ransomware? Um, I'm really fascinated about what happened in the city of, in the, of Atlanta and how it actually didn't make more news that a city got ransomed. And is that a bigger threat in the future, or is it something that... It, it's a huge threat. So um, in the same Verizon report that I just mentioned uh, this year, 2018, the first time they ever talked about uh, ransomware embedded in malware was in 2012. So we're six years out from that first report. It represents 46% uh, of all attacks now. Right? So this is a an evolving space, um, and thank you for the setup, because I, I was actually going to ask um, about, there's this sort of notion of targeted attacks and untargeted attacks, and ransomware oftentimes falls into that untargeted attack. Um, so let me set it up that way for, for the panel. Jeff or, or anybody? Ransomware is bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if you, if, you, if you get to the point where you have your computer um, um, hard drive encrypted and you can't use it, there's not a whole lot of options that are available to you to recover from that. If you don't have a good backup of your data, then you're, you're either going to have to pay the ransom or you're stuck. I mean, there's just not a, a lot of things you can do from that perspective. But don't pay the ransom. Yeah. Don't pay the ransom. 
that just one, encourages the bad guys. Don't pay the ransom. I agree. The one, the one thing that I think is important is to having good hygiene. In a lot of these cases, uh, it's just like going to the dentist. Uh, if you don't go to the dentist on a regular basis, you know, you have other problems or you don't repair your car. It's going to re lead to other other issues. In the case of city of Atlanta, you know, they patching patching is is critical. Good hygiene, having a good strong um, cybersecurity program in place where you go through the rigor, you go through the monthly, the quarterly updates. You apply those things, even though it may be a a a, a, a disturbance to your to, to your business. It's critical. It needs to be a part of the risk that you take on as as a, a way of doing business. But yes, um, it's ransomware is bad. <laughs> Remember, you know, bad guys are rational criminal actors, right? So what we've seen in the short history of cyber stuff is an evolution on different ways to monetize. Uh, and so, you know, it started with uh, stealing, um, you know, bank identifying information, credit card numbers, bank account numbers, things like that. Um, as the banks got smarter at killing fraud, um, when those numbers are disclosed, uh, that sort of thing went down. A credit card number now in the black market has almost zero value. A checking account number in the black market now has almost zero value because the banks are so good at shutting off uh, fraudulent activity. And so the bad guys have moved along. All they want is money. Ransomware is the current you know, way to get money. And, um, and, and they'll do it because it's easy. Um, and it's relatively low risk until it doesn't get the money anymore. Then they'll move on to something else. By the way, one... Um, we're seeing a really significant uptick in what I call individual extortion. Um, so um, if, if you know, a corporate email account is compromised and a bad guy calls the company and says, um, you know, give me a million dollars and I'll delete all your email and won't put it on you know, the dark web or, or wherever. Most Western companies call the FBI at that point. We don't take real kindly to, to being extorted. However, what the bad guys have found is that if they compromise Jeff's email account, and then they reach out to Jeff and they say, eh, you know, there's this, eh, you probably don't really want your boss to see what's in your email account, do you? Or you probably really don't want your wife to see what's in your email account, do you? Um, give, me, give me five grand and I'll delete it. People do, they do, um, in frightening, frightening amounts. Um, and, and people are just getting, they're, 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 they're getting railroaded um, with that because obviously, you know, cats already, first of all, they might not have ever been doing anything wrong, um, but, uh, uh, but, but people are falling victim to that because they're embarrassed and they don't know any better. We've seen that with a lot of the compromises of um, adult websites. Um, so uh, with the adult friend finder and Ashley Madison and some of those from a couple years ago, we had large scams going where uh, they would email people and say, boy, you know, you're in the adult friend finder database. Give me five grand and I'll delete you. you know, well, you know, lots of people fell for it. And it's sad, it's sad, but it works. I think we have time for one, one more question. <clears throat> okay, uh, good. My name is Sarah Edwards, I'm with Merrill Lynch. My question goes back to spoofing. Lately, my husband and I have been getting a lot of callbacks from people we didn't call and they said, hey, I got something from your number. Is there any protection against that? Um, because I think we can all agree that the do not call list is only so effective. If you're getting a lot of those, your PBX might be hacked and you might wanna look into that, quite honestly. What, what does that mean? Your phone system. Talk to your phone system person. Because okay. that's how the bad guys, the bad guys will compromise your phone system and then use your phone numbers. Okay, so, so if people are calling carrier? you saying, why are you calling me? There's a chance that they might be using your phone numbers because of that. Carrier, like Verizon or AT&T, is Did that what you, you mean? Your business, or you said? No, it's a, a personal cell phone, it's an iPhone. Oh, well that's different. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's harder. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's harder. There's, there's no authentication in that system at all. Um, so, I mean, if, if, if somebody wanted to, you know, put on the caller ID, your phone number or my phone number, 555-1234, they can. There's no authentication in that at all. So, for some reason, they like your number. So, yay you. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Yes, my name is John McKnight with Rife's Auto Body. David, you'd mentioned earlier that um, your information, I think you said your family's information is already out there. You said the cat's out of the bag and you can't put it back in. Um, is there any uh, one area or areas that I'm most vulnerable to that cat getting out of the bag? Um, not so much 
the, you know, my credit card number got picked off off of, you know, Target's uh, server and they used my credit card number, but my identity, all of my information out there, is there a, a certain thing or things I should be looking at uh, where I'm gonna be most vulnerable for that kind of thing, where I need to really pay attention? Well, I, I actively monitor what's going on with my credit uh, and, and do that for my entire family. If I see uh, accounts being created kind of uh, randomly or, or something that I, I'm not familiar with, I, I do do that. But again, with my, my data being compromised, uh, you said my social security number, uh, where I live, I had 10 years of, of tax returns in that database that got compromised and, and fingerprints, by the way, and all that got compromised. So um, there's only so much I can do. There's only so much that's gonna be available to us to do that. We just have to be kind of vigilant in, in just looking at what new is happening within my space, within um, the accounts or different things that are being created. Hi, thanks for coming. This has been really interesting. Um, uh, I, you made two references to the dark web and, and the, I, the layman's perception, my perception is it's some place that only bad guys go to um, and once you're on, you're, you're done. But can you tell us a little about the black web and who accesses it and how it works and so on the dark web, I mean, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll let him tell you what the dark web is, but you know, quite frankly, the dark web is nothing that much different than the regular web. Yeah. A lot of people think that there's this, this innocuous place, and it's really not. It's just more curated, and ex um, the access is not available to everybody, so. Yeah, I mean, in, in all candor, the dark web is mostly a marketing term invented by people in the security space to sell you stuff. <laughs> um, it, now, there, there's a little bit more to it than that. It's It's, essentially um, stuff on the internet that is not readily accessible through a simple Google search is, is basically, you have to do something else um, to, to access it. But aside from that, you know, and, and, and typically um, illicit activity tends to happen there because of that, you know, because it's not something that's gonna be easily findable. Uh, but if you know where to go, then, you know, you can, you can get there, but it's, it, it's just the, the, the parts of the internet that aren't, you know, that don't have the nice little Google front end on it, pretty much. The one, the one thing I'll add is in the last comment, it would just be along the lines of, don't go there unless you know what you're doing. Um, your computer will get eaten up in the, in the first two minutes that you're on there, and you'll have more mal malware than what you know what to do with, so. The, the irony is that they, uh, the people that run those different websites really do a good job in managing who gets in. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's very tough to get into some of those spaces. If you're not a trusted person to come into those dark websites, you're not gonna get in. Whack them all. You'll be them all. <laughs> yeah. All right, well thank you speakers for a fascinating forum. Uh, and as a, um, a way to show you a token of our esteem, we will be sending you a link to a gift. All you gotta do is send your, input your <laughs> credit card number, because there is some shipping that's involved in that. But it'll be from CMC, don't worry, it's, it's secure. Uh, let's thank Carlisle, Patchen, and Murphy, and Battelle for their support. <laughs> and of course, our speakers, Irvin Rogers II, David White, Jeff Schmidt, and Nathan Vega. And thanks to all of you. We hope to see you here next week and every week.